access to education into an already existing program and kind of highlight some different ways uh, we could add gambling awareness to two different levels of education, kind of teen and adolescent, so kind of the high school realm, and then also how to add it to a college or university level. Uh, so we're just going to launch poll question one. Have you ever participated in a gambling awareness or education training before? This is just to kind of get a little uh, glimpse as to uh, the general gambling knowledge base of our attendees. I'm going to close the poll and share it so folks will be able to see. <clears throat> so it looks like we're about 50-50, but we do have a little uh, a little majority of people who haven't. So we'll go over some some basic uh, gambling disorder foundations before we move into incorporating it into uh, some other AOD or prevention curriculum. So if you choose the slide you left off on, take it back up. So here we go. So there is definitely a connection of gambling to uh, alcohol and other drugs. Um, I think the popular opinion is this is where we would add gambling awareness to. I think it's also can fit really well into other youth programming such as like positive decision making, youth leadership type stuff, uh, which we will talk about um, in more depth later. Um, but I think it's important to highlight that there is a strong co-occurrence and cross addiction among disordered gambling and uh, substance use disorders. And then also when we're just talking about prevention in general or education and awareness, um, these programs typically cover other related risky behaviors. So we, we talk about alcohol and drug use, uh, um, nicotine use, uh, safe sex, violence prevention. A lot of times those things are uh, kind of combined, so I think it kind of fits well to why not talk about uh, some gambling awareness, gambling education as well. Gambling in today's culture. Gambling is no longer compartmentalized. Um, we don't have to go too far into history to uh, a time when only certain types of people gambled at certain times and at certain places. Uh, these people were, you know, considered a little risky, um, adventurous, uh, maybe even immoral, and they gambled on holidays, vacations, um, in Atlantic City and Las Vegas, this uh, couldn't be more of the opposite right now. All types of people gamble. We can gamble whenever and wherever we want. Um, and that is because of the increase of accessibility. 48 states have some form of legalized gambling, whether that's casinos, racetracks, lotteries. Um, the only two that do not are Utah and Hawaii. And then uh, with technology, we literally have gambling at our fingertips. Uh, you can gamble online on a laptop and then obviously smartphones. Um, and acceptability. Uh, it, it, gambling, is, gambling is extremely acceptable. Um, it's not seen as, as consequential, as severe as something like AOD. Religious groups uh, host things, obviously, casino nights, bingo, um, all sorts of charities and fundraisers use gambling uh, as a way to create revenue and even education right? 50-50 um, raffles uh, at high school, sporting events, um, casino nights at after proms. I know my high school did all of this, uh, these types of things. And then legality, of course, if you're of the proper age and in a proper jurisdiction, then gambling is legal. Quick overview. Um, Americans spent $119 billion dollars in 2014 on legalized gambling, that number could probably be doubled uh, if we considered illegal types of gambling that are also being done. 75% of Americans gambled in the past year and 15% gambled in the past week. Um, 6 to 8 million Americans meet criteria for gambling disorder, while another 12 to 15 million have problems with gambling. And among those with gambling problems, 75% have had problems with alcohol, 
38% have had problems with drugs, and 20% have either attempted or died by suicide, so that's a very large number. Um, and with those top two, we can again see the correlation with AOD. And then again, making prevention um, and education and awareness all the more important, only 7 to 12% of disordered gamblers ever seek treatment. Um, so a very low number of disordered gamblers are seeking and receiving treatment. So what is gambling? Well, gambling is risking something of value on an event that is determined mostly by chance. A person is gambling if he or she puts up something of value, such as money or property. The outcome has an element of chance beyond the person's control. And once the bet is made, it is not reversible. Uh, types of gambling activities. It's very important to mention all of these when talking about gambling, uh, when doing education, when doing screening, uh, which we do here at Recovery Resources, and we'll mention that later. Um, I think uh, if you've been in a gambling training before, you've probably heard this. Uh, people always say, you know, do you gamble? And someone says no. And then you say, do you play the lottery? And they say, well, yes, I do. Um, it's kind of seen as gambling is going to a casino and playing cards, rolling the dice. Those are kind of those stereotypical gambling uh, uh, forms, but lottery, scratch off, bingo, um, fantasy gaming, which is the big thing now, um, are all considered types of gambling. Uh, and to note in Ohio, uh, sports betting and internet gambling, so internet poker, are illegal. Fantasy gaming, however, is still legal in this state. Um, it is being uh, outlawed in a number of states. Uh, whether that's coming here to Ohio, uh, is yet to be determined, but it is still a legal activity um, in Ohio. Casino gambling in Ohio, we have four casinos and we have seven uh, racetracks or uh, roxinos, and those are considered casino type gambling because they have video lottery terminals, which are essentially slot machines. Uh, so we have, over the past couple years, have had a big boon in casino style gambling in this state. So what's problem gambling? Well, gambling is a problem when it disrupts or damages your physical or mental health, your work, school, or other activities, your relationships, your finances, or your reputation. Um, a gambling problem is not, however, dependent on frequency or amount spent. So how often I gamble or how much I gamble when I choose to um, is not necessarily indicative of a problem. Frequency and amount spent certainly can be flags of severity after I'm diagnosed with a problem, um, but they're not necessarily an indication of. Here are the uh, nine criteria from the DSM-5 uh, for gambling disorder. Uh, a preoccupation with gambling, so if we're always thinking about gambling, when am I going to be able to uh, make my next bet? Where am I going to get money to make that next bet with? Needing to gamble with increasing amounts, so a built up of tolerance, uh, a loss of control, uh, withdrawal symptoms, so restless or irritable when attempting to cut down, gambling when distressed, chasing losses, so going back the next day uh, to try to win my money back that I lost, lying or hiding your extent of gambling, jeopardizing, an opportunity, um, and relying on others to uh, relieve financial stress. Um, so those are the nine criteria. You can see mild would be four to five of those, moderate six to seven, and severe eight to nine. And these would all have to occur within a 12-month period. And that tenth criteria with the X has committed illegal X was in the previous DSM-4, but it's been taken out. It doesn't necessarily um, increase uh, the the uh, proper diagnosis of a problem because generally when someone would commit an illegal act they've already reached the threshold um, of a gambling disorder so it didn't um, it didn't more accurately diagnose so it was taken out very quickly over some warning signs um, I think some of the important ones are uh, selling or pawning possessions lying about where one was um, replacing family, friends, or old hobbies with gambling, 
uh, probably spending more money and more time gambling than was originally intended. Um, and of course, there's more and more of this list could go on, uh, could go on and on. Uh, predictors, I think um, a lot of predictors, location, a past trauma. Uh, the big one to focus on is an early big win. I was talking to Dr. Heather Chapman from the Cleveland VA who has treated over 3,000 problem and disordered gamblers throughout her career. And she talks about this and focuses on the early big win a lot. Um, a disproportionate number of disordered gamblers will say that early in their gambling career they had a very large substantial win. Um, and I asked her to quantify this and she said she couldn't necessarily. And I said, well, do you think over like 85%? And she said yes. And I said over 90%? She said yes. So, and she could remember um, a handful of people who didn't report a big win. So I think if you can remember a handful of people out of over 3,000, um, it shows that those kind of people stand out and they're outliers. So an early big win is a very strong predictor of a future problem. Uh, impact in Ohio. Ohio has over 500,000 problem and disordered gamblers. Uh, each gambler, each problem gambler will cost society about $13,000, which in Ohio um, would be $2.2 billion each year. One estimate is that for every $46 of economic benefit, there are $289 in social costs. Uh, those costs could be divorce, bankruptcy, loss of productivity, crime, suicide. We talked about the high suicide rate intimate partner violence, drunk driving, uh, additional health care costs. Uh, the additional health care costs could be where proper referral uh, comes into play. Um, and it's estimated that each problem gambler will directly impact the lives of at least 10 other people, these people generally being uh, family, friends, and employers. So what are some of the correlates? We've touched on them briefly, but um, AOD, uh, oftentimes the OSAM study in 2012 gets referenced. This was a study of over 3,600 individuals, Ohioans, in treatment for AOD. And they found that over 36% of them also had a problem with gambling. Um, and of them, over 27% gambled more when using alcohol or other drugs. Over 16% used more alcohol or drugs when gambling, um, and that 15.6% gambled to buy alcohol or drugs. And there are some pretty, there's also some pretty interesting quotes from uh, the participants in that study. One was, I definitely was into gambling, trying to win more money for the sole purpose of getting drugs and betting drugs and dice games. Basically, gambling is legal, so an addict can turn to gambling because it's, you know, the next thing to do. It's the constant chase for a high, and we're able to do it legally. Uh, so you can see that there's definitely that overlap there. Uh, AOD to gambling, gambling to AOD are using together, um, and they kind of fit hand in hand, so to speak. There are some mental health disorders that have strong correlations with uh, gambling disorder. Schizophrenia, bipolar, depression. Uh, anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of problem gamblers also have a depressive disorder when only five percent of the general public does. So we can see that there's a large dis discrepancy there. Um, and then also some of the personality disorders, borderline personality disorder, antisocial narcissism. Um, and another big thing is crime and violence. Um, obviously with illegal sorts of gambling, um, participating in illegal gambling, whether this is dice games on the street, illegal sports gambling, um, but then also financial crimes that come out as a result of losses due to gambling. Um, and we'll touch on that a little more as well. So poll question two. Have you ever seen or heard of any type of prevention program that has incorporated gambling awareness or education? Um, we're going to talk about now where these, uh, what these programs are, where gambling could fit in, how to fit it in, um, what's been successful in the past. So just curious to see if anybody knows of any programs um, that have done this.
I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. So if you haven't voted yet, go ahead and do so. And I'm going to go ahead and share it with our attendees and presenter here. Okay, so it looks about the same as the last poll. A couple, uh, a couple more people saying no than yes, which is which is fine, which is great actually, because that's what this is for. Uh, we're going to go back to our where we were. So we have a small majority uh, stating that they haven't. So we're going to talk a little bit more about them. So where can gambling awareness live? Uh, gambling awareness can live in general community prevention programming, uh, whether this is alcohol, tobacco, or other drug prevention, uh, some mental health education, or violence prevention. Um, and I have a really interesting thing. We at Recovery Resources go to the Cuyahoga County Jail every week and do some gambling education with the inmates. And it's very interesting. When we talk with college students or other community members and we say what what are the consequences of gambling um, the general first thing is general first answer is financial loss but when we talk with the inmates um, every week uh, it's always what are the consequences of gambling the first answer is always violence and it's uh, that's probably because the types of gambling activities they're involved in are illegal um, so it's just interesting that it could really fit well into violence prevention. If you have a if you have a curriculum that's maybe dealing with justice involved youth, or maybe your school or community is in a lower SES area, I think violence prevention and gambling can fit really well together. Um, and again, going back to one of the first slides when I was speaking on, I think gambling awareness can fit well, if not better into youth programming than AOD. Uh, when we're talking about healthy relationships, positive decision making, youth leadership, I think it can fit well here for a number of reasons. Uh, the message is more accurate. Uh, there's going to be less pushback uh, from the individuals, whether it's a school or a community. Um, and I think one way to look at it is comparing gambling versus heroin. So Cuyahoga County uh, has a large heroin epidemic right now and we actually um, earlier this month we had 12 overdose deaths in just a five-day span I believe it was March 10th to the 14th um, so it's gonna be a difficult thing to get buy-in from individuals when we have an epidemic of that proportion going on um, gambling however being different than drugs uh, if we're comparing it to heroin, heroin's always illegal. It's never good. It's never healthy. There's no way to do it responsibly. And that's a different message than gambling. Gambling is legal. Uh, it does have some positives that can come out of it. Um, and there are ways to do it responsibly. We know about 95% of the population, in fact, can gamble responsibly without consequences, which is why I think the messaging of drugs and gambling is different which is why I think gambling can fit better into a youth programming on positive decision making, reducing risks, uh, as opposed to the actual just prevention side. Um, also school curricula, uh, whether it's a health and wellness class, finance, um, criminology, media and arts even, uh, we're going to discuss a successful program that's uh, brought gambling awareness into, the, into media classes, uh, developing PSAs. And then for higher education, uh, first year seminar or orientations with freshman students, public health classes, social work and counseling uh, classes and degrees, all would, all would benefit from gambling education. So must for integration. I think this is probably the, uh, if you were to print this uh, webinar out and throw it out the window and you kept one, one page, this would probably be the one to hit home on. Um, if we're integrating gambling into an already existing curriculum, what, what do we need? Um, and we need buy-in. Uh, buy-in from the program that we're incorporating it into, buy-in from the community, buy-in from the school. Uh, the same message has to be coming across. Uh, and that message would be that we're not, we are not or you are not anti-gambling. 
Um, however, addressing that gambling is not a risk-free activity, I think uh, in today's culture, the normalization of gambling, the marketing of it, um, especially when we're talking about fantasy sports, is showing that gambling is risk-free. Gambling is entertainment. Gambling is skill. Um, so I think we need to denormalize that message. Um, and offering that we can cover other risky behaviors as well. Um, if we want to go to a school and talk about gambling, we can also talk about AOD. We can talk about safe sex. We can talk about violence prevention, anger management, healthy decision making. Um, so really fitting it in anywhere. Um, and not using scare tactics. I think scare tactics are kind of on their way out. I still see, see some being used. Um, but not using scare tactics in gambling, um, and creating positive decision makers. Again, I think this is where gambling fits best, because uh, gambling can be used and be used responsibly. Um, and we know that the majority of the population does gamble, so just talking about it in an open forum. Uh, and creating strengthening protective factors. So this could be, uh, what are some alternatives to gambling? Um, whether it's joining school clubs, being involved in athletics, uh, things of that nature. And then again, protective factors would be giving the same message across multiple domains. So if we skip over to the other side of the slide, um, we know that peer and cultural acceptance and attitudes of gambling, again, is a strong predictor of gambling behaviors. So um, one thing would be you know, not allowing children to be involved in the gambling activities, say um, selling raffle tickets at sports games, things like that. Um, and building capacity, I think, is a really big thing. At Recovery Resources, we do a lot with um, colleges and, and our gambling awareness and education. And not only do we train students, um, well, not only do we give presentations to students, but then we train student leaders, whether these are kids in, involved in student government, athletic captains, um, RAs in the dorms. We take these student leaders and we train them so then that, that program can live at the university and those kids can continue to educate and train other students. So giving a program, giving a school, giving a community a tangible outcome you know, giving them something they can work with, maybe that the program could be adapted to their community, adapted to their school. So building their capacity is going to be a strong incentive for the community or school to let you in and do and do this gambling education. Also, peer-to-peer -peer leadership, peer-to-peer -peer education and youth leadership, we know that messages um, are taken more seriously, are remembered more often if it comes from a peer. So I think um, again, doing the youth leadership, positive decision-making model, and again, building the capacity uh, is just going to strengthen that message. Uh, so, so if we were to kind of break all those musts down into some goals, I think the, the goals to take away uh, would be we want to create awareness of gambling as a risky behavior similar to alcohol use. It is something that is used by the majority of people. There are ways to use this responsibly. Um, we want to create awareness of gambling attitudes and behaviors. So if we're talking to youth, um, are they gambling? If they are, what are they gambling on? What are they gambling with? When and where are they gambling? So kind of just getting a sense of, of the gambling culture. Um, and then talking about responsible gaming strategies. How can we, if we are choosing to do this, how can we, how can we remain safe and responsible? Um, number two would be increasing those protective factors and alternative activities. Uh, developing good decision makers in health in general and increasing capacity. So here's some current and past programming for youth. Um, Stack Deck was created in Canada and it's been used for a number of years. So it is an in-school curriculum that talks about uh, gambling awareness. It talks about uh, probability and statistics. It talks about um, real chances. It talks about myths and facts of gambling. 
Um, Risky Business was actually developed here in Ohio at Wright State University. This is for uh, justice-involved youth. Uh, it's been very successful incorporating gambling awareness and violence prevention. Um, Caps and Tags. Uh, Caps and Tag is a group of teens at a Massachusetts school that's called Teens About Gambling. So they discuss uh, gambling awareness, but they also created a curriculum in collaboration with the, the teachers at that school. And that curriculum is called Creative Activities for Probability and Statistics. So it's an arithmetic uh, curriculum, but that does discuss gambling and probability and chance. So we see where it can fit in in that, in that light. Uh, and then games, which is what we're going to focus on a little later in the presentation, was a very successful gambling awareness program in Connecticut. And then Betting on Our Future is a statewide uh, curriculum in California that uh, incorporated gambling into their media, uh, their, their uh, media classes. So they took kids who were interested in media and gave them some gambling education and awareness. And then those kids went and created responsible gaming PSAs. Um, and then those responsible gaming PSAs were shown in the school, but they were shown before previews at movie theaters. Um, they were shown on commercials throughout the state. Uh, so that's been a very successful program, um, educating students on gambling, but also you know, putting it in a specific light where they're already interested in and reaching, um, reaching a population that you wouldn't normally think about, right? Again, it's you think that gambling would just fit with the AOD, um, but here it was successfully incorporated into uh, another group of students entirely. Uh, so we're going to launch poll question three. Do you or your organization currently run any prevention programming in school settings? As a reminder, these polls are required participation to receive CEUs, so we hope everyone's able to vote. It's like most of our votes are in. I'll give folks one more second here. This is just to get a sense of uh, if people do prevention programming in schools and how we can, okay, so it looks like most people do not, but some do. No problem there. So we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about games. This was a very successful program in Connecticut that incorporated some gambling education and awareness into their schools. So why talk about gambling with adolescents, right? That's the thing. Adolescents don't gamble. They don't know about gambling. They can't gamble. That's what a lot of people would say. Adolescents are gambling, and they actually know a lot about it. Um, very quick personal story. Just a few days ago, I was out walking my dog, and my neighbor, uh, who has a, a, a son in fifth grade, I believe, fifth or sixth grade, came out and asked me, Mr. Buzz, that's what he calls me, <laughs> said, Mr. Buzz, do you want to buy some March Madness squares? And I said, Zach, come here. I brought him over, and I said, what did you say? And he said, if you want to buy some March Madness squares uh, to support my baseball team. And I said, your school's baseball team is having you sell March Madness squares. And he said, yes. Okay. Um, I get that. They want kids to go door to door. You know, you might get more people interested than selling candy bars or something, and the kids have to do it rather than the parents. But I wanted to test him a little bit. I said, what, what, what is squares? How do I do that to see if he knew? And he knew. He told me it's a it's a big 10 by 10 board and you you put your name in a square and depending on what number you get if that's the same number as the outcome of the game then you win so not only is he selling these is he involved in selling the squares but he knows about it right so this is I, I think what we need to do is rather than trying to prevent this gambling because it doesn't seem like that is necessarily going to happen but we really need to educate youth on what it is, what are the consequences, how to do it responsibly, getting well informed, because it, it is out there and it is happening. So why talk to them about it? Well, youth are risk takers, right? Uh, we know that. Their brain's not fully developed. We talk about that a lot with 
um, our youth in the detention center that we go see. Um, youth have a preference for short-term rewards. Uh, they have a preference for low effort, high excitement. Obviously, uh, why video games are such a big draw to youth. Um, well, what is more low effort or high excitement than you know sitting at a blackjack table or in front of a slot machine? Obviously, the youth can't do that, but it's they, they see it, they know about it. They they have a low capacity for judgment and decision making, um, which is why we need to talk about positive decision making, making good decisions. Um, they're also at, at extra risk for those um, that live with ADHD, the ones that use uh, alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, and then uh, low self-esteem. All those are very big draws to gambling. Um, and then the big, the big thing to hit home on is youth today are the first generation to be fully exposed to multiple forms of legalized gambling. Um, when I was when I was a teen, when I was a child or teen, um, there weren't casinos here. Um, we don't have to go too far back to when there wasn't a lottery here in this state. Um, so teens are growing up, youth and teens are growing up as the first generation with full-blown, complete accessibility and acceptability of legalized gambling. Um, I th think that's a really big thing to remember. And also just why it's so it's so normalized to them, right? So games. Why was games successful? What were their core concepts? Um, well, games was promoted as not anti-gambling. Um, students were taught how to make healthy choices, reduce their risk for addiction, set their own personal limits, and recognize risks and warning signs and others. And again, it was not it wasn't promoted as a gambling prevention program but a peer youth development program incorporating problem gambling as the message. Um, I'm doing, currently working on a study with the National Council for Problem Gambling, and it's a nationwide survey about current gambling prevention programs. And what we're finding is that the majority of them, not only the majority of them, but the majority of them that are also being successful are not called gambling prevention programs. They're youth-led prevention programs. They're peer development. They're things like this. That's how the message is getting across. So I think that's something uh, that all gambling awareness should focus in on is not is is the messaging that we're um, how we're promoting these programs. Uh, the findings from games uh, from two different uh, firms that did studies. On games, youth gambling behaviors have risen in surrounding communities since games inception, but have remained the same in Monroe County where it was. Uh, I forgot to mention games was started in 2000 when Connecticut um, brought in casinos. So that's why we see that uh, the gambling increased in surrounding communities but stayed, stayed the same, which is a great thing. Uh, the data also indicated that games promoted protective factors. So during the program, there was a decrease in discipline referrals. There was an increase in teacher attendance. And there was also an increase in students involved in other uh, school-sponsored activities. So again, um, promoting those protective factors and the other alternative activities to be involved in gambling. Um, one quote was that games has become a conduit for open discussion about risky behaviors in general. So um, I think the, the kids involved in that program uh, felt comfortable since they were they, they felt comfortable discussing gambling. They were able to feel comfortable discussing other things. Um, and in an environment where kids are often inundated with talk of don't drink, don't do drugs, uh, this program communicated messages of self control and limits. Uh, so. A, a, again, a different message than the typical uh, AOD messaging, and they take well to that. Compared to control schools, compared to the control school, uh, the ones involved in games, students feel more comfortable at school. They were less likely to view gambling as cool. They were more able to clearly define signs and symptoms of problem gambling. They were more able to describe how to set limits for themselves and others. Uh, and they were more able to refer another for help. So I think these are astonishing um, outcomes 
that the kids involved were able to do these things. And a new challenge arising. Um, I don't know if we have enough time to go to this link and look at it. I absolutely encourage everyone else to do that. Um, so the NFL has a school curriculum for fantasy football. And in this curriculum, uh, and this is for, uh, this starts in grade six. So um, kids are told to go to fantasy football, to the NFL.com, and they actually create uh, a, a fantasy football team. And they're taught on the statistics of fantasy football, so how much a touchdown is worth, how much a completed pass is worth, how much a field goal is worth, etc. And they actually play the fantasy football throughout, throughout the season and throughout the, uh, the school year. And they're given what are called quote-unquote scholarships um, for the kids who, who win the fantasy football. But this is, it's just an incredible thing when we're talking about the normalization of gambling and especially the recent normalization of fantasy gaming. Um, so I encourage people to take a look at that. It's very interesting. And absolutely um, feel free to email or call me anytime. I could share more about that um, and share more about anything we're discussing. So what about college? Um, there are some current programming for uh, gambling in college. Uh, the Catalyst Bystander Intervention Program is here at Recovery Resources in collaboration with the Cleveland Rape Crisis Center. So we go to colleges and we discuss uh, AOD, we discuss gambling, we discuss mental health, and we discuss sexual violence. Um, the NCAA has a program called Don't Bet On It, so this is gambling awareness for student athletes. And then there's also a new curriculum called Smart Bet, which is for high school and college students. Um, and there's actually going to be four trainings in Ohio throughout uh, the month of May uh, on this. One is in Cleveland here at Recovery Resources. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, you can get more information at Recovery Resources about that. Uh, but college. So college-age kids uh, live in a perfect storm. Um, their age is uh, associated with risky behaviors. Again, they're the first college generation to be exposed to wide-scale legal gambling. Um, it's acceptable in college. It's operated by governments, again, sponsored by faith-based organizations, um, incorporated into mainstream culture. Another thing with fantasy gaming, it's promoted as sport, it's glamorized, um, it generally only shows winning. Um, and then access to cash, the average college student receives about 25 credit card solicitations per semester. 6% uh, of college students have a serious gambling problem. Uh, these gambling problems can also uh, include and lead to psychological difficulties, unmanageable debt, and failing grades. About 85% of college students have been involved in some form of gambling and 23% report being involved on a weekly basis. And compared to their non-gambling counterparts, students who had gambled in the past year had higher rates of binge drinking, marijuana use, cigarette use, illicit drug use, and unsafe sex after drinking. Uh, and again, just these, more, these college students are more susceptible to gambling problems due to the perfect storm we mentioned previously. College athletes, 67% of college students bet on sports, nearly 30% of male student athletes bet on sports, and 1 in 20 will bet on games they are directly involved in. Uh, talking about the administration and policy, uh, where we can start incorporating some gambling. Campus efforts to address gambling and recovery from addiction are almost non-existent compared to that of ATOD. Only 22% of colleges have a written policy on student gambling. Um, and the amount of attention given to problem gambling is well out of proportion compared to the increase in gambling availability and the greater susceptibility of young people to gambling problems than adults. Um, so I think working with administration um, at colleges is the way to start and kind of go from top down. 
So where can gambling education live when we're talking about colleges? Well, it could be prevention focused. Um, it should certainly be mentioned at freshman orientations, um, be mentioned in dorms, whether it's on boards, whether it's training RAs, because uh, gambling absolutely happens in dorms. I can remember going to a number of uh, Texas Hold'em uh, games in, in dorm rooms uh, on college campuses. So there should be some education there. Again, first year classes. And then athletics, um, no matter how old you are, if you're an NCAA athlete, gambling is illegal. And we saw the numbers that we know college athletes are not only betting on sports, but may even be betting on their own sports, which is very problematic. Um, and then it could also live in curriculum. So degrees in public health, social work and counseling, finance, um, any one of these. Topics to consider when talking gambling with college students uh, can be a little different than youth. Obviously go a lot more in depth in depth, in depth, uh, and talk about the co-occurrence among ATOD and gambling. We can talk about cross addiction, which is very, very popular. Um, when people stop using, they have more time on their hands, they have more money on their hands, and they can spend time and money gambling. You can talk about finances. Um, Talking about fallacies, so the myths around gambling uh, and the superstitions around gambling, gambling should absolutely be talked about. Um, correcting erroneous beliefs, discuss, discussing myths and facts, and just having general discussions on luck, chance, risk, odds. What do these words mean? You know, what are the true odds? Uh, so screening, to kind of finish up our last uh, section. Screening for problem gambling can happen before, at the end, or dispersed throughout uh, an assessment. So if we're thinking of adding gambling screening to our already existing assessments at our agencies, um, it can be done any one of these ways. The important thing is to not simply ask the question, do you gamble? Because you're going to get an answer of no. Um, and that could be people not wanting to know others about their gambling behaviors, or it could simply be what we mentioned at the very beginning, that people don't consider certain types of gambling to actually be gambling. So instead, give examples of what gambling is. Um, these are uh, popular screens that are used. We're going to focus on the first one, the BBGS. That's what we use here at Recovery Resources, and it's pretty much the standard that uh, should be used. The BBGS is a three-question screen, and an answer of one yes would uh, denote further screening. Um, these questions uh, refer to um, withdrawal, they refer to hiding, and they refer to bailouts. So have you become restless or irritable? Uh, have you tried to keep your family from knowing? And have you had such financial trouble that you had to uh, borrow money for financial assistance? Um, here's a picture of our screen at Recovery Resources. It's not the full gambling screen, but how we do it, so going back a couple slides, we don't simply ask, do you gamble? Um, we give a full list of gambling activities. So have you been involved in going to the casino, going to the racetrack? Uh, do you buy lottery tickets? Uh, play bingo, do you play cards with friends, etc. Um, and then we ask the three BBGS questions, as you can see. And if they answer yes to one of these uh, BBGS questions, then those, those numbers three, four, five, and six will light up, and the assessor will go a little more in depth into their, into their gambling behavior. So um, have you had some financial trouble? Um, when was the first time you gambled? How much money do you gamble when you do it? Um, I know there's a couple more. We give them um, some scripts and some tips and questions on uh, how, to, how to go a little more in depth about their uh, gambling behaviors and their gambling career. Um, so certainly very brief and very basic, um, but there is help. Uh, if you or someone you know is dealing with a gambling problem, help's available. At recovery resources and a number of other agencies. Um, 
again, I, I'm sure there, there are a lot of questions. Uh, if people have questions um, later today, tomorrow, in the future, feel free to contact at any time uh, about any sort of prevention program. I thank you for your participation. Listen to me talk for an hour. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Mike, I'll, uh, we did have one question in the chat during the webinar. Um, just someone wanting to know more information. Of, do you see organizations using gambling as an easy means of raising money for their organizations? Um, well, absolutely. Uh, I don't know if the question is referring to any organization or more specifically other recovery organizations, treatment recovery organizations. Um, that is a very hot discussion. Um, organizations in general uh, absolutely use gambling to create revenue and to create just uh, camaraderie. A lot of businesses have March Madness brackets. A lot of businesses use uh, raffles and lotteries as a way to create revenue. You're going to create uh, more fundraising with gambling than a car wash or a bake sale. So absolutely. But if the question is referring to other prevention, treatment, recovery agencies using internal gambling, um, I have seen it. I know a lot of people are against it. Um, I'm kind of up in the air on it. Uh, I do know that that gambling can create more fundraising than other thing, other other ways. Um, I think it, it it it's kind of on the fence. It has to be done in an appropriate manner, and if it is done, should it be done along with some responsible gaming resources. Um, so if that's people pooling money, you know, for the um, for the big, what was it called? The Sorry. Powerball. You know, if people are are uh, are gathering funds to put in a whole agency ticket for the Powerball, you know, something like that, I think is okay. I would refrain from illegal gambling. So, you know, not having a March Madness pool or squares um, for a March Madness uh, tournament, things like that. So, I hope I hope that helps. So we have some more questions. Thanks, everyone, for your questions. Um, I hope we're going to be able to get to as many as we can. But as Mike mentioned, we'll uh, share his contact information again. So one question we had, just looking through these, are treatment recovery services still free when the gambling is co-occurring with other untreated addictive behaviors? So I think uh, that question asker is referring to someone who maybe has a an alcohol mm -hmm. or other drug diagnosis in addition. I'll mention too, so I, some questions yeah, in to. here are um, a little more treatment focused. Next week we have a treatment focused um, webinar, so I encourage you to attend that and potentially uh, we'll address some of those questions there. But going back, so when someone has a co-occurring disorder and they access services, are they still free? Yes, gambling services are still free. Uh, they're not only free for the gambler, but they are free for um, the family as well, whether that's uh, family treatment, whether it's just uh, um, whether it's group treatment, family treatment, individual treatment, it is it is free and we encourage um, we strongly encourage family members uh, if they're not interested in treatment at least to call and get resources from our prevention. Uh, people in the gambling department. Um, we have a lot of great resources on uh, on on finances for loved ones of gamblers and things of that nature. So we would strongly encourage them to do that. Great. So a similar question. Someone asked about Gamblers Anonymous, um, and is it an effective addi addition as a community support? Um, they asked, would it be part of a, a treatment plan? Um, which might be more uh, appropriate for our, our clinical webinar, but I think Mike can speak mm -hmm. to uh, Gamblers Anonymous as a support for folks. So Gamblers Anonymous absolutely um, would be used in conjunction with treatment, um, and there are Gaminons. So again, for the family members, there are Gaminons. The one caveat is 
that a lot of gambling treatment is harm reduction based, um, whereas GA, just like AA or NA, would be abstinence based. So there is a little um, push and pull with ideology and philosophy there. So I think gambling or Gamblers Anonymous is a great and successful thing to be used in conjunction with um, treatment and recovery if the treatment and recovery goal of the client is abstinence. Um, if a client is, is in more of a harm reduction model, then um, you, it's, it's, some, it's something to think about whether going to GA is, is the right course. Sure. So another question, um, I know we talked about online sports gambling, so just fantasy sports. Someone asked, can you talk about internet gaming and its correlation to gambling? Um, so if the question is referring to internet gaming, um, so not internet gambling, but internet gaming, the kind of, uh, the, you know, the fantasy life stuff, uh, I think there is a correlation there. There's a, a researcher out of Britain, actually his name is Mark Griffiths, uh, that is G-R-I-F-F-I-T-H-S, Griffiths. Um, I would encourage this person to look him up because he has a lot of studies on internet gaming addic addiction. Um, I think there is a correlation there because, again, we're talking about a problem is based on the, the consequences. Um, so if it's taking that person away from school, work, other worthwhile activities, um, and especially the financial part there because I, I know I don't do them myself, but I know on the internet gaming, you can buy things like upgrades or if it's weapons or levels or whatnot, you can buy them. So there is definitely a financial aspect, especially for youth who have maybe, you know, their parents' credit card, you know, just continuously buying things for that game. So I, I, I think there is a, 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 an association there. Yeah, I think one of the difference would be, so if you're playing a, a, an app and it has in-game purchases, but there's no risk involved, so I'm buying an in-game purchase, but there's no, mm -hmm. you know, reward or I think that is a delineation. Um, so everyone had really great questions. I appreciate everyone's engagement in the questions here. Someone asked, should this programming, so I assume um, problem gambling education or, or gambling awareness, should this programming be part of the AOD treatment in residential and IOP programs? I think it should um, because of the, the kind of cross addiction there. Uh, the agency I came from, Lake Geauga Recovery Center, out in Lake and Geauga counties, um, east of Cleveland, had residential, had many residential uh, facilities, and I visited those often to talk with the residents about um, about gambling addiction, and we talked about uh, the co-occurrence, and we talked about cross addiction, and a lot of them took to it very, very well and they saw how they could be completely similar. Um, a lot of them would say, you know what you're talking about, I can totally see myself getting into that, and now I know to kind of stay away from it. So I think uh, gambling awareness should absolutely be um, put into some, some residential education, for sure. So this is more of a comment, but I, I think it brings up a really good point, and it can even loop into what you're talking about, Mike, with, having education in treatment programs, residential IOP treatment. Uh, but someone had the comment, I think, in reference to doing programming in schools that some of our educators may be dealing with addiction and gambling. I think that's a great comment. Um, yeah, uh, very possible. Yeah. So, you know, whether, and again, kind of going, I, I mentioned it once with the colleges, but it certainly could be for high schools and, and lower, kind of doing the top-down model because you have to really get, get buy-in. So, you know, maybe before you're asking to, hey, I want to come into your 10th grade health class and talk about gambling, you know, first we need to educate um, whether it's the school board or the administration. Um, I know, I, I don't know what they're called, those teacher days, the teacher only days where the teachers go in for a whole day and, and receive education on different things, you know, going in there. So just educating the teachers first. 
Um, I'm laughing. It's teacher day. <laughs> it's teacher I, think day. It's, I think it's like it's staff and service day. It's teacher day. Staff and service day. <laughs> Sounds a lot more professional. Um, so going to a staff and service day and, and educating the, the staff and the faculty first um, is a great idea. And absolutely, I'm sure there are yeah. uh, some teachers struggling with addiction. And it's something, too, Mike mentioned, uh, go, you know, the work we done going into outpatient treatment groups and residential treatment groups and doing some presentations. We've even found that with other alcohol and mental health um, clinicians. So they are very well versed in drug and alcohol addiction. They're uh, potentially less familiar with gambling. So hearing us provide the education to their clients, it's increased their awareness or knowledge um, or oftentimes, uh, Mike kind of alluded to this earlier, a client who they would be working with, they had no idea gambling was a mm -hmm. problem for this person, but by having that conversation in group, it, mm -hmm. it kind of comes up. Um, okay, there was another one here. So somebody asked with more um, casinos now being available in Ohio, are we seeing an increase in problem gambling? So that's a fantastic question. And it's kind of a, a loaded oh, answer. Let me, okay, before you, Actually, the, the question was more of, with more casinos, is there a decrease in illegal gambling? So mm. almost of uh, kind of two different questions. But. Yeah, uh, I'll do the second one first, just because I think it's shorter. I don't, I'm not sure. Illegal gambling is still certainly going on. I don't know if there has been a decrease. I think that's that would be a hard thing to find, but it's something that we should look into. Um, to the first question, the percentage of people who have a problem with gambling has not risen due to the casinos coming to the state. Uh, it is still 5% of the population has problems with gambling. However, more people are gambling because of, because, um, of the casinos coming here. So there has been an increase in problems when you're talking about the raw numbers of people, more people have a problem, but the percentage of people that gamble that get a problem has remained the same. So um, there you have it. There so you have it. We have reached one o'clock. There's still some more questions in here. So I'm able to um, see who asked the question and maybe we'll be able to do some follow-up via email um, with some questions. There's great participation. Really appreciate everyone coming. So as we log off, some uh, housekeeping items for all those who want to get their CEUs, which is, you know, probably everyone. Probably everybody. <laughs> it's not hot to get some free CEUs. Teacher day. Yeah, it's, it's teacher day. Um, <laughs> so again, if you want CEUs, uh, you're going to receive an email tomorrow that's going to have a link to SurveyMonkey. Again, complete that survey. It has some post-test questions. You do need to, to pass the post-test. Um, as well as complete the evaluation, then I'm able to send you your certificate. So you will get that within uh, seven days after completing your um, evaluation. So the sooner you get that in, the sooner I can turn around your certificates. Um, let's see. Just if you're more, if you're interested in uh, further training from uh, recovery resources, we offer a variety of different trainings. This year we're launching a a whole prevention series that's uh, launching here in March. We have our clinical supervision series, other treatment related topics. Um, we manage the statewide um, problem gambling treatment uh, in, I believe, April and May, the advanced April, uh, April and May um, in Cleveland and Columbus. So mm -hmm. April 7th in Cleveland, April 8th in Columbus, and then May 5th in Cleveland and May 6th in Columbus. Yep, so we have a, a lot of training opportunities. I'll actually go ahead and send an email out to all the folks here on the webinar with information about those in case you're interested in registering. Um, in June, we do have our day-long symposium. We're excited to have a second symposium. Um, so actually some of the the, the comments that you have made in the webinar could potentially, uh, in future webinars or trainings, fuel what, what type of topics we discuss. Um, but again, our, our day-long symposium, June 17th, it's going to be at Benjamin Rose again, and that information will be out shortly to be able to register. So thank you, Mike, for your wonderful presentation. Um, 
If you have any other questions, my name is Ashley Hartman. I'm more than happy to uh, help you with anything. That email is A-H-A-R-T-M-A-N at R-E-C-R-E-S dot org. And uh, Mike shared his contact, so let us know if there's anything we can do. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, stop recording. Oh, we didn't mute ourselves. Bye!